we rejoice at our soul salvation. Lord, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and we consider our conduct from day to day, uh, we, we just must exclaim the same thing the Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. And yet, God, that you said that you will keep us and you'll renew us by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, we're thankful for the salvation that you've wrought for us through your Son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we, we come with thanksgiving tonight uh, for these praise reports concerning our sister Kay and, and Brother Mick's family uh, getting into a Bible-believing church. And Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for uh, just seeing uh, their soul's safety, Lord, as they heard the Word of God preached and believed it and uh, followed through with believers' baptism. Lord, what a wonderful, exciting thing. And Lord, we thank you for uh, getting to see Jace's baptism on when, or on Sunday morning, God, what an exciting thing that was to see him to take that first step of obedience as well. And we just pray that you'd prosper that, help all three of them, Lord, in their endeavor to serve you. And Lord, we pray, or we thank you, Lord, for just uh, this wonderful rec- report concerning Miss Kay. And uh, Lord, I, I, you know, we we know that you can, we know that you're able. That's why we petition heaven. That's why we ask. But Lord, we're still uh, in amazement at times, Lord, that you'd see fit to answer our request. And we're, we're we're thankful that you do. And God, we just want to give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, uh, for thou art worthy. And Lord, we we just thank you so much, Lord, for hearing our our prayers towards you concerning this matter. And Lord, we do pray as the process continues with our sister, uh, Lord, would you uh, allow everything uh, to follow suit? And Lord, we we do pray uh, that there's no other issues that arise out of it, Lord, but that this would be um, the uh, the end of the matter, Lord. We pray, Father, tonight for my uncle, uh, and we thank you for uh, Brother Bob's uh, testimony these last several years, Lord, how you have truly uh, changed uh, him and and helped him, Lord, uh, to live for you and to really renew his testimony um, in front of his family. And we uh, don't know how much longer he has here on the earth. We're thankful to know that when he departs that uh, he'll be with you, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Um, And Lord, we do pray, Father, that uh, during this time that you would just touch the hearts of my cousins, help them, Lord, to be tender towards you, and God, that they would... uh, uh, repent, believe the gospel, Lord, that they might also be saved. I pray for my aunt, Lord, would you please minister to her and help her, Lord. And I pray, Father, that uh, you just strengthen her as she stands by her husband's side. And uh, Lord, I pray that you just give her wisdom during these days uh, and, and know what to do and how to respond. Lord, I pray for my wife, Lord, as we look for this day uh, to come for the delivery of our child. We thank you, Lord, for seeing her through thus far and for how Jonathan has grown and developed. And uh, as far as we can understand, there's no issues there. And we thank you for that. But we pray, God, that um, as, as, uh, as the day draws near, we pray, Father, for wisdom and discernment about uh, what we should do and how we, sh- how we should uh, just uh, conduct ourselves in regard to whether we need to go to the doctor or not. And I pray that you just give my wife wisdom uh, and discernment about her own body, uh, Lord, that you uh, show her what she needs to do. Lord, I pray for uh, Jace and Emma and Travis, Lord, for their soul's salvation, Lord. And we know that the, the power uh, of, of God unto salvation is the gospel. And, Lord, we know that the gospel works. And we just pray, Father, as we try to consistently minister that truth to them, that they would see, receive it along with uh, those other individuals, Lord, who are uh, dead in their trespasses and sins, and, Lord, they're headed on their way to hell. And Lord, we're thankful for the soul-saving message. Lord, help us to proclaim it. And we pray, Father, that you would allow the ground for which we uh, uh, sow the seed on to be fertile, that it uh, uh, bear fruit unto everlasting life. We pray, Father, for Miss Amber tonight. Lord, would you minister to her, and we're thankful for her profession of faith. Lord, we know that there's a lot of things going on with her physically, and uh, that she stands um, really in the balance uh, in a lot of ways concerning her physicality. And I I pray, Father, um, that you just work your will in that circumstance, whatever it may be. And Father, I pray for her spiritual condition with uh, her relationship towards you. We do pray, God, that you just... Lord, you do what only you can do. We, 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 we put her in your hands, but Lord, we pray, 
Father, that you'd please turn her towards you once more. We pray for Miss Lisa, God, that you'd strengthen her and, and help her, Lord, and give her peace uh, as she seeks to pursue you in spite of it all and help her to maintain a good testimony before her daughter. And pray for Miss Margot as well. And God, you just help these two dear saints um, uh, just uh, uh, live a life uh, that's pleasing in your sight in front of her. Lord, that that may be a source of conviction for us that she might do the same. And Lord, we pray, Father, for uh, those that are affected in the world by uh, the evil men and seducers that wax worse and worse. And Lord, many, many things going on in the world, too many things to name. And uh, people are perishing. And people are dying. People are going to hell rapidly. And uh, Lord, we, we just puts the emphasis back on us to make sure that we're proclaiming. But Lord, we do pray for those who are uh, the, the family and loved ones of those that are um, victims of uh, the, the, the sins of men. And we pray, Father, that uh, as, as they witness these atrocities, Lord, not only that it would um, bring some clarity of their own uh, mortality, Lord, but that it would cause them to question what would happen to them if they pass from this life into next? And Lord, they might uh, repent and believe the gospel themselves. Lord, we pray uh, for the young people. Lord, they're immersed in a culture that is anti-God. They're immersed in an education system that seeks to destroy their faith in God. Lord, the, the leaders of our nation, though even those who have some semblance, some form of godliness, they deny the power thereof. And Lord, as, as we look around, uh, there's not much light left in America. And Lord, the, the young people are, are sitting in darkness. But Lord, we know that the, the darker it gets, the brighter that we can shine our lights. So Lord, help us, Father, to be that what needs to be uh, for the sake of the young people, Lord, that come up after, uh, that you may uh, start a revival of souls, Lord, and that you may see many people turn to you, God, that they'd be sick of their sin and and see a need for a Savior. Father, I pray tonight that you'd please touch uh, Miss Tara's grandchildren. And Lord, we pray you'd preserve them as uh, the day approaches of their delivery as well. And pray for her son. And uh, Lord, we ask God that you just uh, uh, be in the midst of that situation. I pray for Miss Tara. And Lord, you know all of her needs. And, and God, we're thankful that to know that you're, you're capable of taking care of her and everything else going on in her life. And we just pray that you'd strengthen her and uh, give her peace of heart and peace of mind as she seeks you. And Father, that you would uh, just bless her with your presence tonight. Pray for Miss Pam. And Lord, we're thankful for her testimony and how she has uh, been such a blessing to her husband. And we pray that you'd just help her as she's there with him tending to his needs. And we pray for Brother VJ. We're thankful, thankful for his profession of faith. Thankful for uh, the time that I had to get to know him, Lord. And just pray, Father, as he's there on hospice care, um, that the, these days that he has left, Lord, would be good days. And, uh, Lord, that you allow uh, uh, them to be days to be cherished by them both. And, Lord, many tonight raise their hands for unspoken requests. And, Lord, you know what their needs are. And, Father, I, I just ask tonight... Um, that uh, the, the, so, many, so many of us, Lord, have so many different circumstances in our life, but we know that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so, Lord, we pray tonight uh, that you'd see to it that the needs that are there are met, and, Lord, that it would be, the result would be that men and women uh, would be more fervent and zealous in their service to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray tonight one more time as we open up the Word of God. Lord, would you help me to preach? Help me to minister the truth? Lord, would you help me, Father, to remember those things which I've studied? And I pray that the people before me tonight uh, would be able to receive it and make application in their lives to the glory of God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles tonight turn to Jonah chapter number 1. Jonah chapter number 1. I don't always have a, a title to my message um, before I preach it. Usually I try to figure it out afterwards. <laughs> uh, but, but I know what it is tonight. And I'll just go ahead and tell you. Maybe you can consider it as we're going through verse number 3. But the title of tonight's message is The Dangers 
of disobedience. The dangers of disobedience. Let's read here. We're going to read the first three verses, and then we'll get into the message. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 1, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord. In verse number one, we see the call, the word of the Lord came. In verse number two, we see the commission, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And God help us tonight. Isn't it good to know that God has called us to a great work and we're laborers together with God? Isn't it wonderful that God has entrusted us with a commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel? And we approve those things and, and we hear those things with gladness, but God help us tonight not to just be an approver, be an applier. Not just to be a hearer, but a doer of the Word. You know where I think we fail is not that we want to symbol. You that are here tonight, you, you want to be at church. You, you want to hear the Word preached. You agree with what the, thus saith the Lord. The, the Bible says that you in your mind, you're already saying the rest of the phrase. That settles it, right? But, but where we fail is execution. We've got to make sure that we are up and about the Father's business. So we've got the call, we've got the commission, but in verse number C we see the callous nature of Jonah's heart. The response that Jonah had to go and to preach to these people was that he would rise up to flee. And, and though we know he's a prophet of God, he's in a prestigious position, he proves here that his prejudice against these people is more important than God's proclamation to them. See, Jonah we find, is more similar to you and I than we thought. Not only does he have a relationship with God like you and I have, not only have we, has the word of the Lord came into our life, but, but Jonah, just like you, just like me, is willing to do what God says as long as it is aligned with what he wants to do. As long as it's in line with his desires. And how many times have you and I said, Oh, I, I, I'll do that. Lord, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm for that. I'm not doing that. No. Uh -huh. Lord, I'm sorry. Uh, I just I can't go there. Uh, I, know, I know that's what the Bible says, but let me give you a couple excuses. <laughs> I, I know that's what I'm commanded to do, but let me just go ahead and tell you why I need to compromise. And what we find is we only go as far as our desire lets us go. And Jonah's desire was great enough to serve God in, as a spiritual advisor to a king and telling him the truth and proclaiming the word of God without compromise. But when it came to these people, Jonah said, Sorry God, can't do that. And that is why you and I must saturate ourselves in the Scriptures so that our desires can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You know why Jonah probably didn't have the right attitude towards these people? Do you know why Jonah probably kept these prejudices in his heart? It's because he was more concerned with his people. He was more concerned with his nation. He was more concerned with what his worldview was, not what God's Word had said. And I'll tell you tonight, we can have a wrong perspective and we can have wrong desires if those things that, are, that, that we are consuming are not the words of God. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse number 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And there are some that would say, well, God will give you whatever you want as long as you love Him. Now, I don't know about you, but there's some things that I wanted that God didn't give me, and I know I love Him. Right? 
What is the Bible telling us here in Psalm 37 and verse number 4? The Bible is telling us, if we will delight ourselves in the Lord, then we will desire what He desires. I, our desires will look like God's desires because we delight in what God is, who God is and what God wants. And so we can be very free from what Jonah is experiencing right now just by making sure that we live in accord with His Word by delighting in Him. Our desires will be right if our perspective is in the right place. And I'll tell you, if all you're doing tonight is filling your thoughts with the fodder of the world. All you'll have is the world's perspective and the world's desires. You know what God made the nation of Israel for? Not, not just a He can call a people out by His own name. Not just to be a, a nation which would produce the Savior, the Son of God. But that they would be a light to lighten the Gentiles. They were supposed to be a source to all the world to see the true God, the living God, the real God. Not the fake gods. And so therefore, Jonah had lost sight of the true purpose behind the nation of Israel. And he had just got so wrapped up in, well, I'm an Israelite. I'm a Jew. Oh, look at, we are, the, we are God's chosen people. We are it. We're the greatest nation on the face of the planet. And so therefore, those dirty, nasty Ninevites over there, they don't deserve for me to go. Now, if Jonah had been delighting in the things that God delights in, aren't you glad that God delights in mercy? <laughs> if Jonah had been having his heart set on the things which God's heart has set upon, he wouldn't have had that thought process, would he? He would have thought, Oh, Lord, this is an opportunity. Lord, if I sent, maybe this message of judgment that's coming to these people, they'll see their need, they'll see that they're going to be condemned, and, and maybe, Lord, there'll be an opportunity that they can repent and you can forgive them. That would have been Jonah's, but, but he didn't have that because... He was too blinded by his own desires. He wasn't delighting himself in the Lord. And we, we need to be reminded tonight, the people of the world, they're going to be wrapped up in all manner of perversion. The people of the world, they're going to be undesirable in the light of the Scriptures. And the people of the world, the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness, so we shouldn't be surprised that the people of the world are wicked. So as we understand this, as we are sent out, just like Jonah is sent out, as the call is given, as the commission is given, make sure that we don't find ourselves in the same position as Jonah and be callous to these people. But let's also remember, there's no excuse for disobeying God. None whatsoever. Maybe Jonah could have said, well, well Lord, if I go in there, and, and I try to proclaim the truth to these people, they might kill me. doesn't matter what did God say. God told Jonah to go. Lord, if I go in there and these people are, are repentant and they're preserved, then they may rise up against the nation of Israel at some later date and destroy us. doesn't matter. What did God say? I mean, those sounds like some really good excuses, doesn't it? But there's no excuse for disobedience. Whatever Jonah's justification was for not going to Nineveh, it did not nullify God's command to go. So here we see, but Jonah rose up to flee, and it says unto Tarshish. Now I want you to turn your Bible to Genesis chapter number 10 tonight. The first time we find this word mentioned here is in Genesis chapter number 10. I, 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 just, I just want to point this out to you. It's so interesting. Genesis chapter number 10 In verse number 4. Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 4. The Bible says, And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Verse number 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Now, 
Jonah didn't want to go to those people that didn't know God. Right? Jonah didn't want to go to those people that were living in wickedness. Right? So he decided to run away to a place whose inhabitants didn't know God. Does that make any sense to you? Lord, I'm not going over there. Those people are wicked. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to go over here. And the people over here, you know what they are? They're wicked. There's no excuse for disobeying God, but I'll tell you, when you do disobey God, you make a lot of dumb decisions. When you don't follow the Word of God... Some, some people say it like this, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Well, if you don't listen to the Word of God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to fall into error. Now, how silly does that sound? Well, I'm not going to Nineveh because I don't like the fact that they live in paganism, so I'm going to go over here to Tarshish where there's a bunch of Gentiles that live in paganism. That's just silly, isn't it? Uh, look at 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. There's no excuse for disobeying. Whatever your excuse is for not doing what God said to do, God says that doesn't matter. I said to do it. It's not going to hold up on the day of judgment. God's like, oh, well, your excuse was really good for disobeying me, so we'll let it slide this time. Okay? But then secondarily to that, every time you live in disobedience to God, you're going to end up making a lot of dumb decisions. Second Chronicles chapter number 9. Amen. Second Chronicles. It's, it's way, it seems like it would be further along, but it's not. It's way back in the beginning. Second Chronicles chapter number 9. The Bible says in verse number 27, Second Chronicles chapter number 9, or excuse me, verse number 21. Hey, son, come up here beside me. Bring me that flashlight. Thank you. I want you to go sit over there on the end of that. On that, right there. Second Chronicles, chapter number 9, and verse number 21. The Bible says, For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Huram. Now, now listen to... We know Tar, Tarshish is the island or the isles of the Gentiles. How do we know that? That's what the Bible said. And then in verse number 21, it says, Every three years... Once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So Tarshish, whatever kind of place it was, it had an abundance of prosperity, did it not? It was a place of financial prosperity, but it was also a place of resources. There, there was plenty of goods to be had in Tarshish. And so what we see, why did Jonah run to Tarshish? He wasn't really thinking about the inhabitants. Maybe he was thinking about what he had to gain if he went there. Maybe it could provide a comfortable life. Maybe as he ran from his prestigious position, he thought, well, I could just you know, get a job doing any old thing. Everybody over there in Tarshish is rich, and I'll just run away from God and live over there for a little while. But I'll tell you this tonight. Regardless of the comfort that the world may Provide. It will never be worth it if your conscience is constantly under conviction. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. The Bible says this of the individuals who would be disobedient to the Word of God, those who lived under the law. You know what Jonah, Jonah was a, a, I almost said a participant. Jonah was a Jew and he lived under the law. Look at verse number 15, chapter 28, verse number 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all His commandments and His statutes, which I command thee this day, 
that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, that's a very interesting read. I'd encourage you to read through that whole chapter. Uh, but let's look at verse number 65. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 65. Jonah's running away from God to a nation that doesn't know God because he didn't want to go preach to a nation that didn't know God. No excuse for disobedience. You make dumb decisions whenever you disobey God. But you know what? When you're living in disobedience, there's no peace. Verse number 65. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even! And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning! For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, wherewith thou shalt see. You just think, think about these people who have the world at their fingertips. It's at their disposal. How worthless would it be to have all of those things, but you didn't have peace of heart? It's it's a sad, sad thing. There's a man, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, a very, very rich man. He died in a segregated room, scared to death, of germs. Just just scared that he was going to contract some disease. One of the richest men that ever lived. And I just can't think of his name. Howard Hughes. That's it. Howard Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Renda. Howard Hughes. Had, had the world at his fingertips. But it didn't matter. I'll tell you tonight. You may run from God. You may think you have a legitimate excuse. You may not realize the decisions you are making don't make any sense. And you think, if I'll run to this place, there'll be a comfort, there'll be ease, it'll be, there'll be prosperity for me to enjoy. Yes, I'll be out of the will of God, but at least I'll be able to get a little bit of relaxation. No, you won't. There's no peace for a child of God that lives outside of God. The will of God. And I'll tell you tonight, Hebrews chapter 12 says that God chastises His children. And if you can live in, in open disobedience to God's will and it doesn't bother you, the Bible says that every saved individual is partaker of that chastisement. And if, and if you be without chastisement, you're bastards and not sons. Ye are no child of the Father if the Father doesn't correct you. I'd be very very concerned if I could live in sin and not be concerned about it. And so you can just go ahead and mark it down tonight. Jonah might have thought that he'd flee to Tarshish and just have a perpetual vacation, but I can tell you, even if he were to make it there, and we'd know he didn't, it certainly wouldn't be any type of vacation. It'd be misery. It'd be misery. So, the Bible says, you turn back to the book of Jonah tonight. Jonah chapter 1. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Amen. Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says... But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now I'm just going to make a quick comment here because we're going to remark on it at the end of the verse because it occurs again. But I will say this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You can't run from God. Psalm 139, we mentioned it Sunday morning. The, the, The darkness is light to God. He knows our thought afar off. Jonah might have been running from God, but he wasn't outrunning God. Does that make sense tonight? The Bible says here, Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down 
to Joppa. Seeing the direction that we find Jonah going in here. In, in chapter, three, chapter 1, verse number 3, it says he rose up and then he went down. Do you know that everyone that rises up against the word of the Lord is brought back down? Isaiah chapter 14, case in point, the Bible speaks of the devil. And he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high... And the Lord responds, says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to the sides of the pit. If you rise up in rebellion to the Word of God, you can be sure that the next trip that you have is going to be straight down. That's it. There's a, there's a call to go out. There's a commission to fulfill. We need to make sure that we're not callous, but we understand even in our disobedience. God's not going to accept our excuses. That's one thing we need to remember. There's dumb decisions made when we live in disobedience. There's no peace to be had when we live in disobedience. But when we rise up against God, we can be sure that it's all downhill from there. The Bible says in 1 John, we just got done with that book, but it does say in chapter 1 and verse number 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. But the refusal of instruction, Jonah was told to do something. He refused it. The refusal of instruction leads to spiritual darkness. Every step that you take away from God is another step into the dark. Because God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. When you turn away from Him, the only thing left is darkness. You remember in, in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Why? Why is it revealed? It says, Who hold the truth. They have it. It's in their hands. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. They say, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but I know what the Lord told me to do, but I, I, I know what the Spirit of God said, but I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to hold the truth in unrighteousness. How do you think Nineveh became so bad? Remember their origin, the, for, the, the foundation, the formation of this city as a result of rejecting God. The leadership were enemies of God. The culture was immersed in things contrary to God. And, I, and I'll say this, this is something good to remember. Jonah is a prophet. And it is very likely that he knows the Scriptures, the first five books of the Bible memorized. How quickly we forget the warnings of God when we're wandering in sin. You, you read something in the Bible, and, or you see somebody do something, or, or you hear about a report of a, a Christian committing a horrible sin, and you say, I don't see how they could do that. I don't understand how anybody could disobey that. I don't know how someone would be okay in their conscience doing that. Just tell God no a couple of times. When the Lord prompts you and provokes you or maybe rebukes you or corrects you, just tell the Lord it's not really that big of a deal. And before you know it, those things that you know to be true, they don't have the sting that they used to have. And it's not that the Word of God has lost its power, don't get me wrong. It's that you've grown, grown dull of hearing. And certainly, certainly, Jonah's ears should have been ringing as he's running to Joppa. But he was able to do it because he ignored the words of God. Now, the Bible does say Jonah ran down to Joppa. What is, what is Joppa? Where is Joppa? The Bible says that Joppa is a seaport city. And 
everything about Joppa that I find in the Scripture is good. In fact, we see in Second Chronicles and in the book of Ezra, we won't turn there tonight for the sake of time, but that the timbers for the house of the Lord were received in that seaport and taken up and made and put to use for the purpose of the worship of God. It, it, there was godly industry going on down in Joppa. In Acts chapter 9, we see the Apostle Paul go down to Joppa to see Tabitha, who had died. And we see the power of God become apparent in that place wherein the Apostle Paul is used by God to bring back again Tabitha from the dead. We were reminded of how Peter in Acts chapter 10 went down to Joppa to go see Cornelius and gave him the gospel and Cornelius was converted. What a, what a wonderful place to be. What a, what a good place to be. What, I mean, there, there's, there's nothing bad about Joppa. In fact, the only thing bad that I could find about Joppa in the Bible is the fact that Jonah ran there in disobedience to God. I'll tell you, there's no excuse for disobedience. You make dumb decisions when you live in disobedience. There's, there's no peace to be had when you are living in disobedience. But I'll tell you this, disobedience can make a good place ungodly. Disobedience can make a good time gloomy. It can turn a blessing into a burden. Disobedience can. God can bless you with health, and you use the health that God has given you to pursue sin, and that, that, that one time of health that you had, you pursued sin with all of your strength, and now it's wrecked you. It was a good thing that God gave you, but it was used improperly. It was a good place for Jonah to go, but it was the improper purpose for which he went. Disobedience can turn good things into bad things. The Bible says, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So here's Jonah. He rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord to go to Tarshish. And wouldn't you know it, he goes down to Joppa and there's a ship just waiting on him. What a blessing, what a coincidence. How about that? Just, just They probably had his name inscribed on the side. For Jonah, God must be okay with what I'm doing. Isn't that great? What must have been providence. There's, there's a, a, a phrase that I use, and probably you use too, and I mean it in connection to the Lord. Where He guides, He provides. I believe that. But you know what? The Lord's not the only one that we can attribute that philosophy to. Because I'll tell you, the devil loves to foster disobedience. And as soon as he caught wind of Jonah running from the will of God, he said, don't worry Jonah, I've got a ship ready for you buddy. Don't worry, Jonah. I've got something nice fixed up. We've got three-course meals. We've got a whole crew to take care of you. In fact, Jonah, once you get aboard, you can just go down there and go to sleep. He's got it all nice and prepared. The devil will foster your disobedience. I'll tell you what. I don't want the devil to foster anything in my life. You know why? We, we read what's next. It says, He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. Oh, the, the devil will give you exactly what you want. But there's a hefty price to pay. Sin will cost you. Oh, it'll cost you more than you ever thought it would. It'll cost you physically. It'll cost you financially. It'll cost you spiritually. Sin will ruin your reputation. It will, it will corrupt your relationships. It will ruin your retirement. Brother Luke, what are you talking about retirement? You know, we're going to stand before the Lord one day at the judgment seat of Christ, and there's going to be an opportunity for rewards. And the sins which we commit could very much corrupt every opportunity we had to receive one. 
and will be saved so as by fire. So sin, or excuse me, disobedience. Disobedience, there's, it'll, it'll be fostered by the devil, but disobedience has a hefty price to pay. The Bible says, and he went down into it. Verse number 3, but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it there it again, in the same verse, down twice as he runs from the presence of God. But here what I'd like to, I'd, I'd like just to make this observation, what happened to Jonah when he entered into that ship? He became a passenger. He relinquished his control of the situation. He has surrendered himself to the direction of the winds and the waves of the sea. That's a type of the world, by the way, in the Scripture. And he's given himself over to wherever the captain may steer the ship. And you know the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4 that the God of this world is the devil. He's become a passenger on Satan's ship. He's relinquished control. He's become a, a child once again of disobedience. He's a servant of sin, it seems. He went down into it. You know, I, I'm reminded there's things in this world that people are addicted to. And they were just running from God. They had a good excuse lined up and they started making some dumb decisions and, and there wasn't really any peace in their life as they lived outside of God's will. And lo and behold, there's a ship for them. And the next thing you know, their life is driven about by whatever this addiction is. And they're just so far gone that it's no longer them in control it's the relationship. It's the substance. It's whatever it may be, you fill in the slot. Whatever that addiction may be. Disobedience is dangerous tonight. The Bible says, and he went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish. When you forsake the Lord you will find fellowship with fallen men. When you forsake God, you'll start making friendships with those people who are living in contradiction to God's will as well. And, and as you are out of God's will, you may begin to bind yourself to these relationships, to these Friendships that once you finally, as the prodigal son did, come to yourself and come to your senses and realize you need to get back home to the Father's house, you realize that, that, that relationship that you've bound yourself to, you've got to draw with you. It's like a ball in a chain around your ankle. Once you get right with God, it just doesn't go away. What a sad thing. To, to go with them, those people, you might I remind you that you are a testimony, either good or bad. And so therefore, whatever you do, it's, it's, it's reflecting back on your father, as we saw in verse number 1. And you think about those people, that as they look at you, you're, you're on Satan's ship with them. You're like Lot and Sodom, and you're telling them, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, nobody's listening to you anymore. Oh, what a sad thing. You find fellowship with fallen men when you forsake the Lord. And then lastly, at the end of the verse, the Bible says, from the presence of the Lord. Here, here is a, a sobering truth that we should all be aware of in those moments where we are weary and well-doing and we feel like giving up on God and the, the things of this world have somehow caught our attention one again and we're allured to go back out and, 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 and invest in those pleasures once more, we, we ought to remember this. Things that we do in disobedience to God don't disappear when we come back around and try to do right. The Bible says... Be not deceived. 
God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, there's so many people. They're saved and they, they just get messed up. And then they, in, in genuine repentance, come back to God. I mean, there's not, there's not anything in their heart that they're withholding. They have sincerely repented of any evil that they had done. And now they're, they are trying just as hard as they can to live for God. But they're still reaping all that wickedness that they sowed during their wild days. All those things that they pursued, they still seem to come back around and hinder them, even though they're doing right. I'll tell you tonight that disobedience is dangerous. It's dangerous because there's, there's no excuse for it. We're not going to be able to get to the judgment seat one day and tell God, well, there's a really good reason for me as to why I did this. He's not going to accept it. It's dangerous because you make dumb decisions when you're living in disobedience to God's Word and it leads you into spiritual darkness as you reject the instruction of the Word of God and, and you'll find no peace. And you'll pursue whatever you have to to try to get that peace back. But as long as that, that pursuit is not of God, there'll be no peace. And, and you can turn a blessing into a burden as long as you're living in disobedience to God. And the devil will foster you every step of the way. He'll, he'll hey, you need a ride? You going to Tarshish? Here's a ship. I'll take you. There's a hefty price to pay for disobedience. And those things done in disobedience don't just disappear. We ought to remember the words of Samuel as he reproves Saul, who had the kingdom torn from him because of his disobedience. It says in Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Don't let the devil deceive you and think, well, uh, I can, uh, I'll just ask for forgiveness later. God will forgive you. But there's a lot of consequences connected to disobedience. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Father, Lord, we are thankful for the Word of God. And Lord, as we see the life of Jonah and, and we see these consequences come to play in his life, we're thankful that it's not us that have to go through it. We can look at his disobedience. I pray you'd help us take heed. Lord, that we'd hear the warning that we wouldn't turn a deaf ear. Oh God, that when you call us and command us to go, that we'd rise up and do whatsoever thou biddest us to do. And God, I pray, Father, that there wouldn't be anything in our heart, any personal prejudice, any pride, or anything that would uh, try and subvert your will in our lives, Lord, but that we'd delight ourselves in the things that you delight in, that our desires would align with yours. And God, I pray, Father, that there's somebody here tonight Lord, they're living in disobedience. They don't have peace. They're, they're making dumb decisions. They're, they're pursuing things. and They're finding the devil fostering every type of passion that they have. Lord, would you help them come to a place of repentance tonight? Oh God, not that there won't be consequences attributed to it, but Lord, that they could stop the sowing of corruption. And that the harvest would be a little less than it has to be. Lord, we just pray tonight that you'd bless our assembly. We thank you for our dear saints here tonight. And God, we pray that you'd go with us throughout the week. Lord, as we have opportunity, help us to give the gospel. And Lord, that we live in holiness, that you might be pleased. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, thank you so much for...
your attention tonight. I would remind you, as we approach Sunday, it's Father's Day. Amen. I got to thinking about that. What if, what if this baby comes on Father's Day? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Uh, but I would remind you, there'll be no PM service this Sunday on Father's Day. No PM service. So we'll have a Sunday, Sunday school, Sunday morning, and no PM service, just so that you are aware. All right. God bless you. You are dismissed.